to infinity and beyond. This is me. This is how I win. Were you rushing or were you dragging? Answer! You're a wizard, Harry. Say what again? Say what again? I dare you. No. I am the father. Hasta la vista, baby. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Hello, everyone. Welcome back inside the film room. Zach Goins here and Johnny Sobchek. Johnny, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well, Zach. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm ready to get started on another episode. We're really getting in the groove here with this new team. We've got our new logo. Cartoon Johnny is here, baby. Hell yeah. I feel like... What do you think think of the the, the figure? (laughs) Well, first off, definitely have to shout out to uh, Jordan. How do you pronounce his last name? Jordan Sane. He was a Jordan former Sane. graphic designer for the Tar Heels for the football team back when Jake and I were there. So he did the OG logo. And then uh, now he's working with some other teams. But I reached back out, hit him up, and uh, sent, sent him one of your photos over. And I was like, hey, man, I'm willing to pay you if we need to. Like, this, this would be great. Just want to get it consistent. And he's like, oh, sure, I'll do it for free. No worries. So I was like, okay, sweet. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, thank you to Jordan Sane and go check out his work. Um, but yeah, I love it. I mean, it's just so cool because I always thought that the the graphic with you and Jake was really neat and uh, was fit well with kind of what, what the project was and the podcast was like. So yeah, now I, feel, I'm I feel very honored to uh, become the new cartoon face alongside you (laughs) so in in addition to you joining though now it's i'm an official adult because i'm no longer wearing my football (laughs) jersey on the podcast i'm a washed up tar heel football (laughs) player now i'm just wearing a nice like blue shirt (laughs) so so that's 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 the end of an era yeah that is kind of strange to see that so it, it is fitting though and but uh, it would also look even more strange if i was wearing full unc <laughs> football uniform and you're in a green v-neck <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's a little bit of a, a disparity visually but but we made it work it looks it looks good it's good stuff thank you again to jordan sane but let's let's what do we have on tap today johnny what are we what are we getting into yeah so we have you know some cool little nuggets of news sprinkled throughout this past week that we're going to hit on including some trailers um casting news and then of course we had uh, a couple releases recently especially this week the big one was the devil all the time netflix uh the latest from them with a huge cast that has kind of gotten a lot of attention online uh as well as antebellum which i haven't seen um but you were able to watch that and that's a, a vod release and you have your review written on the website, which people can check out there. Um, and I'm going to, you know, kind of talk to you a little bit about it and feel it out. Do uh, it like the Mulan to... one. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get that. So, so again, it's not the, the Zach lecture for, yeah. uh, for, <laughs> no, for the last half of the podcast. Curious but... to hear more about that movie because it seems very divisive and kind of mixed. So that's always fun. Yeah, that, that's going to be a fun one to talk about. But before we get started, as always, anything exciting going on, I know... Do you want to share it with the world that you're you're an uncle now? I am a, a a puppy. I've been a puppy uncle, but I've gotten a new puppy nephew. Um, <laughs> this is like the whitest thing ever. But um, my my sister, <laughs> hey, and her I'm, a do- I'm a dog dad, so I'm all for it. <laughs> um, my sister and her boyfriend have been together for a few years now, and they got a puppy two years ago for Christmas, and. He's been so fun. His name's Ollie. He's a mini dachshund. And then uh, for his two-year birthday uh, last week, they got him a little brother named Oakley. He's long-haired mini dachshund. He's so cute. And uh, so he's been the talk of the the household and uh, everyone, you know, just taking pictures and getting that social media clout using him. So 
Um, oh, hell yeah. You can go check out my you Instagram if you want to see more of that. But other than that, really nothing too wild happening over here. While we're talking about dog Instagrams, at Golden Pup Remy, go follow that. Get, get my boy Remy some, some love on IG. <laughs> I was cute. in PetSmart. I was in PetSmart. I had to take him to the vet. And they have the dog Halloween costumes out. Mm. <laughs> and, and there's a baby Yoda one. And I mm. have always sworn that I will never dress up my dog. But I saw oh, it. It's I, was like, I was like, oh, my. It's only $20. Like, oh, my gosh. I was so tempted. But I passed. So, Aww. because his name is Remy, so I'm going to try and do, like, a at least hat. put, like, a, a chef hat and a wooden spoon in his mouth or something, something homemade, just to get a picture for the gram to, to yeah, live up to his namesake as a little chef. Yeah, you absolutely have to, and uh, I'm sure there'll be plenty of, with that, my, the dogs I have here, and then my girlfriend has a, a bunny, um, I'm sure these animals will undoubtedly end up dressed up uh, between now and Halloween. <laughs> Well, we can't dress up for Halloween because there's no Halloween is canceled this yeah, year. So no party. Got to dress up the animals. <laughs> <sighs> that's, that's what we're gonna do. But other than that, any other exciting stuff for you? I did a couple. I did some watching this past week, um, catching up on some stuff. But yeah, uh, anything? Yeah, that, but, tell us. Uh, tell everyone what you finally watched. <laughs> hey. Okay. As Johnny is sort of new to this, as Jake was right. well aware that there's a plethora of classic movies that Zach has not seen. But the most recent that I have added to my collection was Jurassic Park. I watched it on Netflix one night this past week. But I will say, I saw it as a child, as a young child. So Mm. I had seen it before. The screen had been in front of my eyes. (laughs) But as as an adult, as any sort of like person with any movie criticism, any sort of analysis i had not seen it so it was good to watch it again through that lens definitely enjoyed it um yeah pretty pretty loved, damn good film i never knew i don't think i ever made the connection before i didn't know that samuel l jackson was in it i didn't know that hold on oh, to your yeah. butts was from Jurassic you didn't know Park. that no i i, I love using that, that gif so it's I, kind of- i've used the gif i have used the gif just ignorantly without knowing where it came from or who it was or what the context wow. was but but uh, that was that was great. I've always used the Jeff Goldblum. Your scientists were so concerned with whether or not they could. They didn't yeah. think whether or not they should use that whenever like a Taco Bell comes out with a new like bastardized <laughs> Mexican dish or something. But it was good to, like I said, good to see it. Good to to kind of get to appreciate it more. And it's still, again, nearly thirty years at this point. Twenty seven years, I think. And it still holds up incredibly well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a uh, that's an amazing movie. Definitely one of my all time faves, especially for Spielberg. So, uh, anyone who hasn't seen that movie, you got to see it. You got to see it as soon as possible. <laughs> um, just get it done, honestly. I'm fine. And then I had to text you guys afterwards, and first of all, I'll let you know that I watched it, and then ask. So, are two and three worth watching or no? And I quickly got a no from the from their group. So, yeah, no. Maybe if it maybe if it's just like. I just really desperately need something to watch. I will just cause I feel like you have to, like if it's on Netflix, like you might as well at some point, like just to complete the the trilogy, but I'm Strong glad to know disagree. that it's, it's, well, I'm just, you've seen them though. I have not. So I mean, I say, that's, I would true. say that I would say <laughs> that to I watch them as a child of, though, just to be just clear. to like complete my infinity gauntlet to add the, the, I've got the Jurassic park stone. I need the lost kingdom stone. And then Lost the, the, World, the, Zach. Oh, whatever. Lost what? World. See, I haven't seen it. That's why I need to watch it. Oh, no. But it's Fallen Kingdom. That's Jurassic World <laughs> Part Two. Um, but oh, I've oh, also, yeah. I've also, in a much better quality of uh, of film and TV than the Jurassic Park sequels, I've also been catching up on Lovecraft Country mm. on HBO Max. I know we had talked about watching it. Are you? Have you watched anything yet? Any of it? No, I, I haven't. I um, am waiting. My girlfriend and I, you know, obviously spooky season is kind of starting. Of course. Up now. Yeah, it definitely and, fits uh, into that. Fits we're going to we're going to binge it uh, some whenever we are able to uh, get the time together again to get that done. So sometime soon before Halloween, for sure. I'm excited. I know there's been I'm not sure how many episodes at this point. Uh, maybe I think there's three or four. I've, um, they're on episode five, six, six airs. I guess by the time this comes out, six will oh, have sweet. aired. Okay, but so you got uh, a lot to catch up on. I've I've watched th- through episode three, so I'm still catching up as well. But it's very 
it's it's really out there which is fun it's like very like crazy magical oh, mystical but yes but also but also very grounded in like very real world stuff of like racism and it's set in the 1950s um so i mean some some real stuff that's obviously prevalent then but still very much in play now so i mean jonathan majors crushes it journey smollett she is great like in the episode three she was she just like crushed it and that's i don't for for those who aren't familiar she was in birds of prey earlier this year um and i really enjoyed her in that so i mean it's good to see her kind of get like a real breakout role where she's not playing second base to harley quinn Um, yeah yeah she was she was awesome as um black canary in that film so i am excited to see more of her and hopefully maybe you know this will get her some bigger roles maybe in film or hey maybe get a black canary series on hbo just throwing that idea out there yeah i mean now she's she's just digging the deeper ties in with warner brothers and hbo so so uh that would that would be very exciting i'd be very down for that but again i am excited to hear your thoughts on it and it would it will be a good spooky season binge for you (laughs) um but Let's use that as a segue to jump into some news here. Talking about our king, Jonathan Majors. He Mm. had some big news this week. Joining the Marvel Cinematic Universe as who? Who do we think? It's not confirmed yet. First of all, he's joining in Ant-Man 3, which is kind of a strange, strange choice to introduce such a big character. They're expecting him to be playing Kang the Conqueror, which is... yeah. Do you want to go into, usually this is when I like turn it over to Jake for some in-depth comic book <laughs> analysis. I know you're really deep into DC. I don't know your extent yeah, I'm not as, of your Marvel fandom. But. Yeah, not as familiar with Marvel, but I do know, uh, yes, uh, Justin Kroll from Deadline Hollywood, he reported that he is going to be playing Kang the Conqueror, which is the fact that this guy is going to be in Ant-Man 3 makes sense in a couple of respects. The fact that the pre- previous couple Ant-Man films all you know, both added something significant to the universe, not just the Ant-Man, you know, side of things. Right, like the whole quantum realm. Yeah, it played a factor in the Avengers movies. Um, And I have no doubt that this character, if he appears in Ant-Man 3, as as it is being reported, he will play a factor in in more films. He'll probably uh, more than likely appear in other films and things that he does in this film may affect, uh, you know, movies down the line. Maybe he'll appear in in an Avengers movie. Um, and I mean, this the, is the, like the replacement of Thanos, basically, from what I understand. With yeah, like he the could lore definitely of be the, the comic next, books, the, He's next the big, big bad. bad. Yeah, so, so I would not, I wouldn't expect him to be the main villain in Ant Man three, just because of like, like you're saying, yes, they introduced that's definitely, that, but yeah. it's like a smaller scale thing versus yeah. okay, he'll he'll be an Easter egg here, or they'll reference him here, and then he comes in. To I think the most exciting thing with this is the potential for this being like the doorway to the fantastic four which yeah I, as we all know that was like in the disney fox disagreements all that stuff that they finally got access to that property so like we've had two iterations of this before on the big screen and now they'll actually have the p- potential to join the mcu and this could be like the the perfect segue for that yeah because he the, the for people who don't know kang he's basically a time traveler and has a ton of control like over time itself um so and the the mcu has played with time travel multiple times now of course uh most significantly in endgame uh and so i could definitely see him you know weaving through multiple storylines affecting you know multiple characters and multiple even time periods maybe um and and again this does make sense because we've heard it also rumored that ant-man 3 is kind of set to be the the thor ragnarok of the ant-man movies it's supposed to be kind of bigger in scale um more epic and and more um you know in encapsulating other aspects of the universe just like thor had you know with the hulk and valkyrie introduced and then Mm -hmm. um tying into infinity war and that kind of stuff so definitely definitely more excited for ant-man 3 now than i ever i've always loved i've always loved the ant-man movies like i haven't seen ant-man and the wasp really that was that that's those two i mean i wouldn't say they're like my top in my top five of marvel movies but i mean i I always loved the fact that they were like standalone movies almost Mm -hmm. because it's like 
especially Ant-Man and the Wasp that came right after Infinity War. So it was like, okay, we had this gigantic, big escapade. And then, okay, now we're going to bring it back to this more self-contained story that yeah. lets us kind of like take a breath. So, yeah. and, and then of course, who doesn't love Paul Rudd? I mean, what a guy there. So that, that's always been a big draw for me. So, and also shout out Peyton Reed, UNC Tar Heels, director yep. of Ant-Man. Carolina Ant-Man alum. Series. So that's, that's all exciting, but I think another and thing. And Jonathan Majors, uh, you, um, North Carolina School of the Arts alum as well. So North I didn't Carolina know that. Re- representing. Yeah, he went to, uh, he was in the, the acting program there. Getting so. that UNC system synergy on in the Marvel <laughs> Cinematic Universe, baby. We, have, we, both, we all have ties to, to UNCSA. Well, he's Jake, Jake's brother. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Connor Lawler, he goes to UNCSA right now on the film film side of things and then my girlfriend is in the acting program there right now too so very cool place um lots of very famous uh actors and filmmakers have gone through there so shouts out shouts to to the unc school system um but last piece before we move on from this the significance of jonathan majors who is of course a black man he is playing Kang the conqueror people are wondering speculating if this is means that we're Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic, whenever the Fantastic Four is introduced, whether he will also be a black man, because there is some sort of, I, I, he's like a, a distant ancestor of Kang. So, I mean, I don't know how distant that is, but. I, I, the, yeah. Um, Kang, yeah. Kang is a descendant of Reed Richards, Mr. Fantastic. So, yeah. I, I mean, I assume with the whole time travel aspect, I'm not sure how far he, you know, future he is either i'm sure it's a long ways but um yeah no it definitely could see that potentially playing into the fantastic forecasting for reed richards Uh, there's uh, plenty of options that they could go with i think Um, that i think recently it might have been brandon davis from comic book um but he had posted something about john david washington said that he had not ever been contacted by dc or marvel which obviously that doesn't mean anything about like okay but just like putting that idea out there that if they're looking for a black leading man and this person hasn't ever done it and he's a major superstar now, like put two and two together, that could be the yeah. time that they give him a call. But also I've seen some fan castings, people suggesting William Jackson Harper, who is yeah. Cheedy from The Good Place. He was in Midsummer, but obviously Chidi's character is pretty nerdy if you watch The Good Place, but my guy is jacked. He's shredded, so he could easily be a superhero as well. And yeah, I think he's, he's very, he he's like super that, charismatic sure. as well, so I think that would, those, either of those would be, would be great, and then people have also, before the Kang news, like there'd been the big push for John Krasinski and Emily Blunt to be the, the Mr. Fan, like the Mr. Fantastic Reed Richards and Sue Storm duo, so that's another thing that, <sighs> who knows what's going to happen but i i would i love both of them i love them as a couple but i think the the potential for either a john david washington or a william jackson harper would be i I think i would like that more yeah i mean they're they're they're, that couple i mean they're just very busy so i it would be hard for me to imagine them tying tying into such a uh yeah. Once you get in Marvel, you're in it for like at least like a seven year, eight year period. So I know. Yeah, I mean, there's, that's just such a big, all consuming uh, franchise to attach yourself to. Um, so we'll see. I mean, there's definitely lots of things, that, you know, up in the air and possibilities. So it's exciting for people, you know, fans of the MCU and fans of Fantastic Four. Yeah, definitely. And just to, again, further diversify the MCU, the superhero world. So exciting news all around but another piece of exciting news that we got this week is the trial of the chicago 7 trailer this was the it's coming soon to netflix october 16th to be precise so right i guess right in the thick of a traditional award season award season might be a little pushed back because of the the new oscars dates and the delays and everything but this is i'll I'll let you take this one because this is a pretty big contender for you yeah, so this has been getting buzzed. I mean, ever since they started filming it, essentially, uh, the cast is absurdly stacked um, with you know Academy Award winners, nominees. Um, you have Sasha Baron Cohen, Mark Rylance, uh, Yaya yeah, yeah. Abdul Mateen II, who is you know coming off of a, a Emmy nomination. 
and is just you know he played you know an Aquaman a couple years ago. Jeremy uh, Strong, then, Jeremy John Strong, Lynch. You know, Succession um, success, and then uh, Eddie Redmayne. So you I mean you can go on and on. I mean it's Joseph Gordon Levitt. He's in there. Yeah, too. he's coming back. Uh, this is the third film he's in this year. So it, it's an it's an all star cast, and it's I, I I said this on Twitter recently. And don't forget I, the writer director. The writer director is none other than Aaron Sorkin, of course. Uh, and for you, for those of you who aren't familiar, he is you know one of the most famous probably the most famous pure screenwriter of all time he did a few good men the social network um he he did his first direct uh directed film with molly's game which was i believe 2017 uh and he wrote that as well um and then moneyball the west wing series yep the west Wing. he's very famous for that um steve jobs jake jake would be jake would be heartbroken if we didn't mention steve jobs oh steve jobs is one of the most like underrated films of the last decade so definitely have to throw that in there uh and he just so he this is his second uh film that he's directed and molly's game i don't know what what your feelings were about that movie i haven't actually seen that no i have not okay molly's game was pretty good to me it it was definitely uh not a super polished i mean you tell it wasn't like a super experienced director um but the script was good as always, and you know the performances were good. But this definitely has the potential to break out. Um, and I, I have this right now. This is my best picture winner for the Oscars next year. It just, I mean, I think I think I'm with you there. Um, just because of the fact, like they made a huge push to get this movie out be- before the election, yeah. which is obviously the beginning of November. Incredibly timely movie. Um, but. I mean, I think just because of like the current situation in America, just all of the the social justice, political stuff that I think that this is going to be, it's going to get some some bonus points because of that. Yeah, and I I said this on Twitter over, like sometime in the last week, but I mean, if you took, you know, if you went into a lab and you had scientists create a best picture winner for the year twenty twenty, like. I don't think you could come up with something that's has this much star power is this, you know, has the political timeliness of this, the social relevance, the, you know, the, the writer director, you know, er- everything about this is kind of set up. I think unless like it, the film would have to be like so terribly average or just not good. I feel like to, just like cookie cutter. Like- yeah. Um, and, and again, this, this is a, a voting body that just two years ago, had green book win um so i I definitely don't think the fact that this is like maybe a you know a story that we've kind of seen before in some respects or is uh, playing into some of the same uh themes that we've seen recently i don't think that is you know i've seen some people say that that might be a reason it won't uh, contend as much i don't think that's really going to be the case i mean they are all for films like this and they've shown that in the past and i think that as as great as mank and Nomadland are going to be. Nomadland is getting like insane reviews right now. Um, I just think that you, to win Best Picture, you usually have to have the right mix of star power, the right you know messaging and themes. And I think that you know Parasite kind of showed that earlier this year. And I think that this could very well um, do this. You know, win it all. Uh, the big prize uh, coming next year. So that's what I have right now is my prediction. It's going to be interesting. I hope it's really good um i'll be bummed if it isn't but i have definitely confidence uh yeah and i mean the fact that that's we're recording on september 18th so less than a month away that's super exciting again we always it's a theme with us that we always give things bonus points because of accessibility that putting it on netflix everyone's pretty much everyone's going to be able to see it from the comfort of their home i mean there it's like you're saying kind of like the perfect storm of just timeliness cast director everything is coming together to make a really solid case for this yeah and and, you know this last little kind of thing that i was thinking about recently was that um you talk about you know an an ensemble cast an all-star cast this cast could end up getting two three four oscar nominations across different categories um you know birdman michael keaton crazy all-star ensemble cast one best picture spotlight the year after that, all-star cast ensemble with, you know, heavy, you know, um, 
political and kind of social context one best picture and then i feel like this with michael keaton in this one again like it's kind of weird if he does get like six and six years three best picture winners with him that would be that's your formula you just gotta cast him and you'll be good to go (laughs) just throw michael yeah you know spider-man homecoming got (laughs) snubbed and no one should forget that's true that was vulture was a great villain but another new trailer that we got moving on from from Chicago 7. You know, it's it, this is the third week straight that we've had Mandalorian season 2 news to share. So, this one is the most significant though, I would say. We had the 2 weeks ago it was the just the announcement of it, then it was the EW feature. We got the season 2 trailer now, and I did my best Johnny Sobchak impression <laughs> going into a trailer analysis deep dive as I as I broke it down. There's a, a post up on the website if anybody wants to dig into it but johnny before i share a little bit of those details what was your initial reaction to this um i mean i like everything that i saw um i yeah. love the, <laughs> yeah it was, I it was the a good, first it was season a good tease. yeah it was a good tease it didn't uh, you know show too much um you know based on what we've heard that there, there are a number of cool new characters that we didn't even get to see in this one this little trailer um but you know you got to see some cool action you got to see some cool visuals baby yoda mandalorian beating some ass um mm-hmm. pretty, much everything you, to, pretty much everything you would want you know exactly i mean the at the very end of the trailer the cut to black and just hearing him like killing everyone <laughs> it was it's was pretty pretty much like yeah, like he, you said exactly what you would expect from from mando yeah exactly but so. A couple little nuggets that I was able to gather from the trailer. Um, it's got the voiceover of the armorer who we saw in season one, the Mandalorian mm-hmm. armorer that kind of helps guide him, serves as a, almost like an advisor to, to Mando as he seeks out what to do with baby Yoda. Um, but we definitely get some footage from Tatooine, the planet, of course, where Anakin Skywalker was born and raised, where Luke skywalker lived as well but we see some tuscan raiders throw back to the sand people um i think one of the most intriguing things is mando or we see them in this city which i did some some zooming some researching and it looks like there's on the planet <laughs> of mon Cala, not the game with the little beads not Mancala, <laughs> but mon Cala, which is where the uh, mon calamari species lives that's of course admiral akbar it's a trap um but so while they're there on this planet in the shadows there's a a woman a hooded woman who's played by sasha banks which is another wwe wrestler Mm. um that's coming in to join the cast but she's just kind of watching them and at the same time um they're the voiceover from the armor is talking about the history of the man the, the like siege of mandalore the battles against the jedi So, of course, like the obvious connections, like, okay, could this be a Jedi who like they're putting two and two together by by having the voiceover and her at the same time. So that's one potential theory. But also people are speculating that it could be Sabine Wren, who is a female human female Mandalorian warrior from Mm. the Star Wars Rebels animated series, which I have not gotten to. I have not checked that out yet. But she was supposedly like a big leader in the early days of the Empire, which this is of course, taking place after the fall of the Empire. Um, But that could be another potential character to keep an eye on with her. Um, And then the last big thing, I think, is there's a scene where Mando and Baby Yoda are entering into, like, a frozen tundra crystal cave kind of thing. Um, And there's some speculation that this could be the crystal caves of Ilum, which Ilum is a planet, and it is it was featured in the Jedi fallen order video game. Did you play that? I did not. No, I, pl- I have not finished it. I heard it's I have really it. And I, it is, it is a lot of fun. I haven't gotten to this part, but apparently you go into the, the cave and this is like in years of star Wars lore, but the crystal caves on Ilum are where the Kyber crystals are, which is what's used to make lightsabers. Um, so again, just another, if this is true, another Jedi connection there. And then this planet, um, was actually excavated in order to be the base of Star Killer Base that we see in uh, the Force Awakens. So maybe Ooh. there could be the fo- early foundations mm. of the First Order in this season. But those are my biggest points there. Again, 
sort of an in-depth uh, review trailer analysis on the website if you want to check out more. But I'm with you. I'm very excited for this. And again, just something that's just over a month away. So October is going to be great. Yeah, no, definitely going to be a, some fresh, fresh content for all of us starved uh, movie fans and, and, and nerds. And again, it's, it's another thing that will be the weekly thing. That's how Mando yeah. does. That's how Disney Plus does it. So it's similar to like how we were talking about last week with football, giving us like, okay, a Saturday and a Sunday to look forward to. <laughs> now we'll have, I guess, I think Mando came out on Fridays. So I think it keep, did, yeah. If they keep that trend, October 30th is a Friday. So something to keep us on track to get us through the week before we get our football on the weekends. Yeah, no, that's going to be really good. I, I like that they're formatting it that way. I know that's kind of a minority opinion maybe, but. It's like real TV. People forgot what real TV is like. <laughs> Um, next piece of news, just a little couple quick hitters here. Um, the Batman is back. Filming resumed on the Batman exactly 14 days after Robert Pattinson tested positive for coronavirus. So glad to see that back in action. Doesn't sound like he had any, any uh, lasting symptoms or, or anything from that. So, so glad to hear that news. I, any, any takeaways for your, your Batman expert over there, Johnny? Um, no, I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I said, as soon as that news came out a couple weeks ago, I tweeted, you know, hopefully he gets, you know, fully recovered as soon as possible and they can kind of get right back into action. And that's, you know, exactly what happened. And that's good news, great news. And, you know, hopefully they can finish the production without any more hiccups or setbacks and everyone stays safe and we get a great movie in about a year. That's all, you know, that's all we can ask yeah. for. For sure. Just to, like I said, quick hitter there. Felt like mentioning that. Another piece of news. This is for all our Triangle listeners up there, all our Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill subscribers. Film Fest 919, which we have covered for the last two years, is coming back this year once again, third year. And they're going old school with a drive-in festival this year. This year. Of course, mm. North Carolina theaters. We don't know what the state is going to be like in October, but as of now, North Carolina theaters still closed, social distancing, all that stuff. So they're going drive-in festival. It's going to be at Southern Village. There's two locations. One is the Greenway at Southern Village, if you've ever been. I don't know, Johnny, have you been to the Lumina Theater over there? I have not, actually. So that it's like a kind of like a shopping center with like a big central green area that they do some movies out. So those are going to be pods, not drive-in. So like, mm. I guess you'll have like a marked off area to set up a chair or something. Um, and then the other option is Caraway Village, which is a new development since I've been gone. But it's pretty much like right off I-40 when you get off at the, the Chapel Hill exit. And that will be a drive-in theater where... You'll, you'll be able to pay per car to come and see the, the festival. And also exciting news, that's going to stay a drive-in theater after the festival. So they'll continue to play oh, wow. new releases out there. So that's exciting. It's starting up October 14th. And because of the just the strange formatting, it's going to run through October 31st with showings on Wednesdays through Sundays. So, I mean, not your traditional, just like we were doing it watching – eight movies in two days or whatever we did like our our cramming but that's exciting i hope we're gonna get to get back for for some coverage there i mean i'd love to to get to see i don't know i don't know their slate comes out next week i think or maybe the week after but mm -hmm. i'd love to get to to get some sort of like normalcy going on even if it is watching from inside of a car yeah i i definitely am curious to see what their their slate looks like and i'm excited Excited to uh, potentially head back up to uh, the Chapel Hill area and see some some new exciting movies because that would be as a long very as we welcome. stay far away from campus because we do not want to yeah. catch coronavirus. <laughs> oh God. Um. So yeah, hopefully we'll have Film Fest nine one nine coverage coming back in October. Final piece of news: We've kind of toyed with this before. We talked about it. Obviously, Mulan came out earlier this month had pretty good success according to, to the reports there's no like concrete numbers or financials reported but after that disney is just comparing i guess comparing i don't know if we ever got like factual evidence but there was that one tweet that either you or josh sent comparing tenants 20 million dollar domestic versus 
uh, what they anticipated Mulan to have done. And it showed that the VOD kind of model was the way to go. So after all of this stuff, Mulan's success, Variety has reported that Disney is heavily considering delaying Black Widow and also considering moving Soul from theaters to Disney+. Plus. So would you pay for that, Johnny? That's the big question. Well, first, I'm looking forward to whenever they do. I'm not sure we're like, when the earnings call is for Disney, but um, I, I suspect that's the first time we'll actually get the real numbers that they might have for Mulan. Um, because, I mean, if they did make as much as what this this firm is kind of saying and, and Yahoo uh, is reporting, uh, it's definitely very impressive. I mean, it'd be shocking. Um, and would definitely in- incentivize studios to consider that. And, you know, Disney will most likely lean on that more if they do put soul on there on disney plus and premiere access I, I would definitely pay 30 bucks to watch soul i mean i think that's going to be a pretty amazing film it's been one of my most anticipated the whole year I'm with and you. that's the kind of thing that would motivate me to you know spend a little money uh and is you know it's definitely more than a ticket at a movie theater but you know if you can watch it with your family or a friend or something you can kind of split the cost and it's of course even you know more worthwhile um, on the other hand Black Widow getting delayed. That, that's not a movie I'm particularly interested in. If, you know, if they delay it a couple months, that's probably for the best. I uh, feel like if- at this point, like because of the continuity, like this isn't in the the like moving forward. You know, like with this is set in a separate period of time than what's yeah. coming for the MCU. That I feel like they just need to go ahead and get it out there because if they if they delay it, because I I would assume if I had to guess there's going to be some sort of like little tiny Easter egg that then links to the next movie or something down the line. (laughs) So like, it still needs to be like, even though this is in a separate time, it still needs to come out prior to the next MCU movie. Uh Um, Whatever that is, I guess Eternals. But so I think they just need to go ahead and get it out of the way. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Black Widow, you deserved better, but. I mean, it deserved to get a movie like eight years ago. So exactly. Yeah. That's kind of like at this point, I mean, I I certainly feel I can sense that anticipation and excitement is kind of waning with some of these movies. Um, Black Widow, I think Wonder Woman 1984 is kind of feeling some of that as well. Um, So uh, the sooner the better. Uh, Theatrical is always preferred, but realistically, these people need to do kind of what they can to make some money, uh, get these films spotlighted in some sort of way, and hopefully they can see some sort of success because... And I mean, uh, a Marvel movie would be 10 times whatever Mulan made. You know, like that's something that just because of people... I think so, probably. the, The Marvel fandom that just those people would pay to see that even more than they would to see a Mulan. That's my belief. But we also got a little tiny, we won't go fully into it, but there was a Disney Plus teaser uh, earlier this week, and it was confirmed that it was talking about what's coming in 2020, and WandaVision was on there. The mm-hmm. first, I guess, Falcon and Winter Soldier was supposed to be out already, but that's still filming delays and all that stuff. So, yeah, that won't be until next year. No. Yeah, so, but now WandaVision will be the first of the Marvel original series to hit Disney Plus. So, sometime late 2020, obviously, but. Uh, We'll have yeah, to December, December is there. kind of the the release that I think that they're aiming for. So that'll be that'll be cool. I mean, it'll be cool to see. I think <laughs> this is the first year. You know, if, if they go the whole year without releasing a film, it'll be the first year without an MCU film since uh, ever. I like since they started. <laughs> right? Um, I, I'm not sure if that's entirely accurate. I mean, it'd be at least ten years. So. Um, it's going to be pretty, pretty wild. And, it, you know, 2009, 2009 did not have one. Okay. Um, but yeah, so, uh, you know, at least 10 years without one. I, I think if they do have to delay Black Widow, it would be nice to have that show on Disney Plus for people to kind of enjoy and stuff. Right. And I, I think you're right. Fix. I think you're right with the uh, December launch. That would be good because then obviously the Mandalorian season two will have run its course starting at the end of October. Yeah. So I think that could be, you could be spot on there. But right. And then they, they may also have soul in November. So it would also be 
uh, as far as films go and kind of spreading out their their big new right. content that'd be a, a smart play good stuff well that is our news today pretty pretty good slate but now it is time to get extremely extremely depressing <laughs> with our review of the devil all the time how and why people from two points on a map without even a straight line between them can be connected is at the heart of our story and knock them stiff. You ever think about how we ended up orphans living in the same house? I know what my daddy did. Some people would say it's just dumb luck. You take pictures? I do. I see a smile pretty enough to photograph, that is. Others would tell you it was God's plan. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. That ain't no preacher. He's as bad as they got on the damn radio. When people look back on it, they had no other choice. There's a lot of no good sons of bitches out there. Excuse me, preacher. You got time for a sinner. So this movie is the late, like Johnny said at the start, latest Netflix film. Johnny is a huge fan of Netflix originals. Uh, He loves them so much. Always wants to see them right when they come out. Can't wait. Um, And this was just like the next one that he was just dying to see, right? Yeah. Um, (laughs) The pause tells me everything. This was a movie that I wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't on my radar or something I was looking forward to or excited about. It was kind of um, mostly interested in, in the cast. Of course, Robert Pattinson is one of the most exciting actors going right now. And then Tom Holland, seeing him in a role that isn't Spider-Man into something more serious and dramatic that, that had my interest as well. Uh, but I, yeah, I, I was, and on top of that though, I was also kind of looking forward to, to another new movie um, just because we were so starved of them recently uh but this was pretty much what i expected (laughs) it was yeah i mean this movie it's it's definitely if people are are looking at it and they're like oh spider-man's in it and robert pattinson like this is gonna let's let's watch it no like this is not for the faint of heart this movie is incredibly depressing incredibly like miserable honestly not in the sense of like i guess i could go both ways but not necessarily like in the sense of like it's bad but just in like it is full of misery like that is that is mm-hmm. what it is that is the the central premise here yeah i mean that's a gr- that's a great way to put it um the the premise is you know for people yeah you know, i am I'm, I'm kind of surprised by just the how much it's been talked about um on social media just the last couple of days especially the, the day it came out uh, Tom Holland is definitely a big draw and he's getting a lot of hype and deservedly so I thought he was really really strong in this movie um, what, what for Tom Holland specifically I was going to ask you um, what were you kind of impressed by him like what were your thoughts about his role and kind of I, mean, the way I think he- I think that he was the best part of this movie he was yeah 100% I mean, hands down and I, I think Pattinson too I mean Pattinson was not nearly as important he wasn't in as much of it and uh-huh. he was also like he was just, Pattinson was just like, as we discussed off the pod, that he's just kind of like, I don't care what I'm doing at all. Like, I'm just out here just doing whatever I want. But that yeah. made it fun because it was just like all over the place, crazy. But I agree with you. Tom Holland was very good. It was very impressive to see him not Peter Parker, not like a geeky, awkward kid that's kind of like stumbling over himself. Um, but to actually, he is the main character here this is a quick plot before we get too far down Mm -hmm. the road here but based on a 2012 novel from donald ray pollock so this is not antonio campos's fault for making this movie so miserable he's just going by the source material but the quick little log line is sinister characters converge around a young man devoted to protecting those he loves in a post-war backwoods town teeming with corruption and brutality and that is a very short and very vague little synopsis, but yeah. that's really all there is. I think that's very fitting because it literally, to me, there wasn't much 
central narrative. There wasn't like a strong storyline other than these like isolated, miserable events, people just experiencing tragedy together. So, I mean, I, I, it, it was very, very upsetting of not, not, I, I didn't really care about the characters. So it's not like I was upset for them, but it was just unpleasant. Yeah, it, it was very unpleasant. And as particularly the first, um, the first you know, half is a lot slower than the second half. The first half is a lot slower, and the first hour or so in particular is very... It is a long movie. I mean, it's two hours, 20 minutes. Um, and it, it, the first 40, 45 minutes is very, like... I mean, it's just so um, upsetting, and there's just so much... I mean, I wasn't emotionally affected by anything in this film. It didn't, like, make me tear up or cry or anything, but... It was very just uh, grim and uh, miserable and just disturbing. Lots of disturbing content. Lots of death and murder and, um, you know. Animal crucifixion. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what, like, that's a perfect example of this. Or, I don't know how much we're going into spoilers here, but. We can, um, we can, we can spoil it. It's okay. And then Antebellum's going to be a spoiler review too. Okay. So, so like, you've been thing, warned. One thing, in, for example, that bothered me about this movie, the direction I thought was just not good. I thought, you know, Antonio Campos, like, yeah, he didn't, you know, he adapted this and he didn't write it on his own, but the way he, he helmed it, it just was felt like it lacked subtlety and it lacked kind of, um, I, I don't know. It just felt, kind of felt like it was going for shock sometimes. Um, or just yeah, it, that's, that's like, I mean, that's part of what I like. I agree with you. That's when I'm saying that it was just like, it was aimless. I feel like there was it, aimless is another great way of describing it. Yes. Because it was I like, agree. like you're talking about with the shock value. It was just like, okay, now I'm going to make this. That's even more sad than the other thing. And then that's going to happen. And it's going to make you even more sad. And it was yeah. just like, Okay, so these are my these are my six tragedies that I'm gonna fit into this movie, and they're all gonna happen. But it doesn't matter how we get in between them; like they're just gonna happen. So yeah, it's, that was that was the biggest issue because I mean the central. I guess the it's just it's literally just like at the end, it's just a vicious like murder cycle of <laughs> like okay, the, at the very end it like wraps together and it's like okay, so this person knew that person who died, and then that person knew this person who died, and that person knew this person who killed that person like that's literally all it was just like and then at the end it's like oh but it was all looped together like oh, yeah. it was some giant revelation or something yeah well when i was talking about the kind of tastelessness of it um and just kind of the lack of subtlety and the heavy-handedness that scene you're, you're talking about you're talking about an animal crucifixion <laughs> um, and it was definitely like this this character is just crazed and and desperate and a religious like fanatic and so he murders his dog and decides to hang it up on a cross and you know he's hanging up on a cross right and he does it as a sacrifice he does it as like a sacrifice and you know exactly what he's doing um and then the his son comes out and he follows him and he looks you know he walks out to where the cross is at and instead of like not showing it or like kind of just showing like the it on like the periphery of the frame or anything or just like a close up where you can just kind of you can know what's happening for sure but you can't see the whole thing he just like quickly just kind of glances the camera across it and like it's it's not any other director i feel like not any other director because there's a lot of mediocre or not you know <laughs> bad directors a, a a director who knew what he was doing with this material or like kind of wanted to take it in a certain different direction I feel like they would have done it in a way that was a lot more like subtle and tasteful. And like, I think more than anything, and, and I, this is something that goes for horror films. It's something that goes for just any, any film where maybe something uh, graphic happens or gruesome or disturbing. There are so many opportunities where you, d you just, it's so much better to not show it or not see it in its entirety because in your mind, I knew that he was crucifying that dog. I knew he was hanging it up on the cross. Right. So that, no, having that in my mind was already disturbing enough. And the fact that I could imagine what that looked like or what that was like. Right. It was already so effective. Just showing it and like flashing it onto the screen in full. It was gratuitous. It was gratuitous. And it, it was so much more heavy handed than what it could have been just by 
having the viewer imagine what it was like because the act of doing it putting the dog up on there i don't have an issue with that i, I mean i'm fine with hey stuff. you're a dog uncle i'm a dog dad I'm, We're stuff, sensitive. I, I'm fine with stuff that's disturbing and and dark but it has to be done in the right way and i think that the content itself was an issue it was the form and the way that it was presented and that's just like a microcosm for me as far as for how how it was how all the content was handled the violence the there's some sexual stuff in this film um there were there's like i mean stuff that i was not expecting i mean right there's, there's yeah a, same cuck, here there's a cuckold sub subplot there's like um tom right. holland and robert pattinson talking about blowjobs in a church um it's just like a very like I, I'm very curious to know, and, and this did feel so aimless. I'm curious to know what the actual novel kind of reads like. Or the, the I was I was like. shocked at the, the when I was looking up the novel. It's like 250 pages, something like what? that. So it's like it's like a th- a slim book. Yeah. And so when I was like, because I one of the things that I noted in my written review for the site was that I was like, okay, this thing could have been maybe potentially better off as like a limited series on like HBO or something. Right. Because of just like, like I said, there's like the six tragedies or whatever. And then, right. okay, well, if you kind of focus one on each, then it lets you weave them together, like episode to episode versus fitting it into a movie. But you would think that with all of that goes down that this is like a 400 to 600 page book. Like I was shocked at that, that news, but I wanted to ask you about just kind of the the sheer like sprawling nature of this mm-hmm. what did you think of the one of the things they do is the timeline so it's like okay we're introducing the young arvin and his father right. and praying at the tree right. but then we're going to go back and we're going to learn about willard arvin's father and what happened to him and then it loops back to the tree and then we continue on forward and then the same thing with um with eliza scanlon's character as well right um so for me, and this is, again, part of the direction, is in part of the, ed- like, I felt the editing a lot in this movie um, because for me, it was so, not only was there kind of elements of whiplash where it would just take you from one time period or like one set of characters and situation to the other and like quickly back and forth or it, it just, I, I don't have issues with that. I mean, I've seen a a million movies that are non-linear like you know Christopher Nolan and all these and, and you know Little Women last year for example that kind of thing um but for me it just felt a it was kind of got to the point where it was predictable because it would set up like one thing in one part of the story and then I'm like oh well this this happening here mean totally means that this is what's going to happen over here and it it wasn't like clever the way it was kind of pieced together it was just kind of like obvious and it didn't feel um super i i mean i don't did you get that feeling i mean how did you feel like it was predictable at all or did you like see like things coming like a mile away like i i kind of did i don't know if i would say like predictable but i did have the the same sort of like reaction to just like the jarring timeline and the the chronology of everything Uh um i think that this also leads into the next thing i wanted to bring up which is the narrator um but oh my god the the narration oh my god right so so (laughs) it's it's actually it's actually the author himself yeah i know uh, it's donald ray pollock narrating and it's like so young arvin started off in the, <laughs> at a farm and he did so it's like this like southern drawl that's just like not fitting at all to to like the sinister like the the just like the dull drama of this yeah movie. Um, yeah so it's very jarring of like okay this guy fit. just this guy just crucified his dog so then after the dog's death like <laughs> it, it, it just like completely draws you no. out but but i would say it's like necessary though because of the the timeline because of like the like you said the whiplash of like so i totally to, to do it i totally i thought i thought that like without the the i think I you could li- completely like do this all. movie without the narration and it would still work i didn't like the narration at all but i thought that it was very important to kind of like keeping things on track with the non-linear timeline like how much how much more interesting would it have been if you weren't being spoon-fed 
all of how, oh, these people are doing this thing in this place at this time. And this is what's happening over here in the, like a different time or whatever. Like how much more interesting would it have been if when those, those characters overlapped or they collided in, in certain different time periods, like it would have but been- You're figuring it out versus- You're figuring it out on told. your own and you're yeah. like, you're being shocked by, wow, I did not kind of, maybe you do see it coming because they, and that's, that's another thing too. People complain about narration because, in voiceover, because it feels lazy. It feels like, well, the filmmaker didn't want to take the time, especially for an adaptation, the, the filmmaker didn't want to take the time to consider how he could use the form, how he could use editing or use cinematography to let people know, hey, this is a different time period. This is a different location. I mean, look at Little Women last year. You know, people were complaining, mm-hmm. some people were complaining, hey, it's kind of confusing because it's going straight back and forth like a decade. Well, no, Greta Gerwig used the, the, the color. The costumes, the to, color, the, the to hair, the explain, makeup. explain, like, yeah, the hair to explain, hey, this is a different setting. This is a different time. And that's just a, a, one small example of how you can use, you know, the form itself to explain what the story is kind of looking like. Whereas here, it's like, hey, this is exactly what's happening. And this is like, it, it almost felt to me at times, uh, and I can't really explain, I wish I could remember what was kind of hitting this this for me, but it almost felt like a, a like kind of a grindhouse, almost like, you know, B-movie, like Tarantino-esque at points. Um, mm-hmm. Like kind of throwing back to like 70s films, you're like, if anyone's seen Grindhouse, or like, uh, you know, uh, the, the Tarantino film that he did with uh, Kurt Russell and the, the car. Um, I have to look up what, what the name of that movie is, but it, it's like, it feels trashy. It feels um, ex- like almost exploitative. Death Proof, that's the name of the film from uh, 2007. Um, it, it feels like lowbrow and in a way where like, I'm not saying, oh, I, it needs to be like some like fine art or like prestige film for me to enjoy it. It just feels tasteless. Like it feels kind of like crass or like, um, I, you know, the, the, the whole situation with uh, Jason Clark and Riley, uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Q? Co? I'm not sure. I was, I was <laughs> hoping you would know. Riley. <laughs> yeah. Um, but they, they are a couple essentially. Um, and they, he like basically gets her into this relationship and then makes her, well, he doesn't necessarily make her at the start, but they basically come to an agreement where they're going to kidnap, you know, hitchhikers. Hitchhikers, yeah. And then they're, his wife and the hitchhiker are going to like have sex and he's going to like photograph it. And then they're going to murder the hitchhiker and dispose of the body and like take pictures of the body and stuff. That and they do this like over very and... quickly. I was like, that did escalate. It, quickly, it started right? with just the like, like you were talking about, just the the like cuckold part. And then <laughs> I guess I guess they let them like go on their way. Yeah. And then when shouts to Dudley Dursley. Um, oh my God! Can we talk Netflix, about this huge guy? Netflix, huge Netflix guy. Why does Netflix want to cast this guy? He is <laughs> but, so bad. <laughs> But like, uh, he's so but, bad. Yeah, he was the one that like it turned to like okay, I guess we have to start murdering them now. But then it was like, okay, it's not just this one. That's like the new kink to take it to the next level. That now we do kill all of them. Yeah. So that was kind of like a disconnect for me when I was like, oh wait, so this is what they're doing now. But yeah, yeah. shout out to to D- Dudley Dursley, uh, Harry Melling. He's just like an insane psycho. Like one of those. <laughs> I, we had to read in my, one of my feature writing classes at UNC, we had to read a story about like a church in rural North Carolina that was like one of the like, they, they preach with like snakes surrounding them and like, oh, the, God. like that kind of like snake venom, like they, yeah. the Lord will protect me kind of thing. And that's exactly what this guy is with his spiders. And like, <sighs> if it's my time, the Lord will take me. But if not, and like dumps a bucket of spiders on him as he's preaching and then <laughs> convinces himself that he can resurrect his wife so he oh yeah what was he, that all about he kills her and then he's like come back lord and it's just like insane yeah like, um like okay Th- and that's another that's another thing too like it has it has these these uh and I, again we haven't read the novel so we can't 
uh, you know, testify to how well it's, it's handled there, but it has these heavy religious, um, you know, tones. It's like the, the dangers of like fanaticism and, and like religious obsession. Right. But like, you know, to what end exactly? Like, okay. Bill Scar's fanaticism is bad. There was no fanaticism like, is bad, guys. Away. Like, wow, what a groundbreaking concept. I just don't understand. Like Bill Skarsgård, he. And that's another thing too. I, I don't understand um, Bill Skarsgård's character at the start of the movie. He's he's in World War II. He sees awful, horrible things, including a soldier that's like crucified and left um, on the battlefield. Big crucifixion guy. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, he comes back and he's like, he, he seems, you know, relatively normal. You know, he's interacting well with the, the, the woman who's um, serving him at the restaurant. And, um, you know, he like has this, you know, uh, inf- uh, infatuation with her. And then he goes home and he sees his parents and, and he's just kind of adamant that he doesn't want to go to church. He doesn't want to pray. Like he doesn't want to, um, you know, basically have any sort of religious like elements in his life necessarily uh and then he goes back and he he's able to court the the waitress from the restaurant they get married uh and that's Haley bennett's character i can't remember what her name is um but they they uh they basically has this little montage of them like starting their marriage and their their life together and then all of a sudden he's like religious again like he's praying and he like builds the cross and the the woods and there's just no really, I, I didn't understand why he went from not being at all interested in religion or like going to church or praying then becoming like devout again. Like mm-hmm. it, it happens like in, in like literally one scene to the next and I didn't really understand. Maybe you can like shed some light on that, but. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> like I just didn't, I mean, that's fine if that's what they want to do, but usually if you want to show this person is like explicitly, um, you know, kind of pressing against being religious or be like being um, like in the church again. And then in the next scene or later on in the movie, he is devout and he's praying and he's like building a cross in his backyard. Usually there'd be some sort of like major event that happens between those two things. Or there'd be like some sort of clear um, like process to go through, but the, it didn't seem like there was, it was just like, bam. Um, and of course you need that. You need him to be religious again, because then when his wife gets, you know, cancer and ends up dying, he is then kind of goes off the rails and is, you know, sacrificing the dog and, you know, making the son pray over and over again to like, you know, heal her and all these things. So um, I don't know. It, it, it just, that kind of sums it up for me. I mean, it, it felt pointless. It felt, uh, you know, like kind of tasteless. It, it just didn't feel like, it, it does it isn't a matter of the content necessarily with regards to how dark it is or how humor humorless it is as, as i've seen some other people like online talking about it it's just because i i love movies like that i mean those are my favorite movies are pretty dark i mean it's just the matter of it being aimless sloppy um two-dimensional not you know uh something that i would recommend really even though tom holland does like exceptionally well um and like really commits to the role i'm excited to see what he does in the russo brothers cherry which is also netflix film i think that's hopefully going to come out in the next few months and uh you know more non-spidey roles that he can find time for but outside of that everyone else was like good like fine uh even robert pattinson who was kind of <laughs> felt like he was kind of phoning it in just kind of like flying off the cuff with his accent and with his like really big gestures and mannerisms and stuff. I mean, it it just kind of, it just feels like, you know, this didn't have a lot of like passion behind it. It just, it it doesn't feel like a very like, you know, where everyone is just on the same team kind of coming together to make this. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you on all of that pretty much. I mean, same, same here. I gave this a 55 out of 100. I gave it two and a half stars, but I mean, this is one that I never want to rewatch again. (laughs) <laughs> um i mean because of the subject matter and also just because like it wasn't that great so yeah. i mean I, i'm perfectly fine never seeing this again like i said 55 out of 100 from me johnny do you have a score 
Yeah, I give it like a 45 out of 100. I mean, it's it's pretty bad, pretty close to terrible. Basically, all of my points came from Tom Holland and Robert Pattinson, so. Yeah, uh, yeah, def- definitely. But, Tom Holland single-handedly kept me from falling asleep because I watched this late at night. And he uh, is also He's also single-handedly holding up the audience score in Rotten Tomatoes, we believe. <laughs> because this, we meant to mention this earlier, but it's got a 66% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes but an 87% audience score, which is astounding to yeah, me. Yeah, I think that's, that's tampered. <laughs> it's got to be uh, just absolutely spam reviews from Tom Holland and Robert Pattinson stands. It's I mean, I think be. there's also, speaking of stands, like Sebastian Stan, like I know Eliza Scanlon has <laughs> also a Sebastian big Stan was, is, is he just not a good actor? Yeah. It was not, not very, impressive he was not good him. in this movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, Fingers crossed that he can, can like, maybe this uh, Winter Soldier and Falcon show will be good for him. But, yeah, I was not impressed. Eliza Scanlon, she was good. Um, Riley Keough and, and, and Jason Clark and, you know, I mean, they're all, they're all pretty good to various extents. But, yeah, no, I wasn't impressed with Sebastian Stan. And Harry Melling, I could do with never seeing him on screen again. But um, last year, last year. <laughs> that's, that's all we need from him. Just, just some done, Dudley Durst done highlights. It. He's done his due like but no. i think i think that's enough that's enough devil all the time talk yeah i'm good with never talking about that movie ever again well another one that we probably won't be talking much about uh <laughs> beyond the next 15 to 20 minutes is antebellum <laughs> again like johnny mentioned i i saw this one he has not seen it so we're going to do it similar to the mulan review where he's going to ask some big idea questions about the movie my experience watching it but before we get into that just a little backstory on the movie itself this was supposed to come out back in april then it was delayed and then eventually got moved to paid vod so it came out on friday uh you can get it on amazon apple itunes whatever platform you use to get your movies but big draw here Janelle Monet uh she is the star the the lead actress here of course singer actress on uh on Broadway we've seen her in Moonlight we've seen her in Hidden Figures in Rio too <laughs> um but that's she plays little plot before we get into it she plays a successful author named veronica henley who finds herself trapped in a horrifying reality that forces her to confront the past present and future before it's too late um so this is going to be a spoiler review so we will get into that's another vague synopsis from uh i can't remember if that's rotten tomatoes or imdb but we're going to get into it and talk about what exactly that means 35 percent critic score on rotten tomatoes right now um no audience score yet because it's just come out before we uh, are re- as we're reviewing this. And my score, 44 out of 100. So a little bit above the critic score, but brutal. Not, not great. <laughs> not great. Um, so I guess the best way to go about this is to I'll give a little bit more of the in depth like plot synopsis so that then you can that'll provide you with some some insight for your questions that you're going to lead this discussion with does that sound good with you i'm ready lay it on me okay so like the the brief synopsis says there's two different timelines basically um we're introduced to a version of janelle monet's character on it starts off with like it's it's actually a really impressive like eight minute one shot like through 1917 style going through this plantation um 
and so it, it's showing like the horror like just establishing the scene and showing like the privileged like plantation owners the children playing but then also the the horrors of the slaves that are being kept there it's introduced to us we're introduced right after an a, attempted escape from a group um one woman gets shot and killed by a slave owner another man gets taken to, to be tortured but uh, a slave who we're told her name is eden that's janelle monet's character she gets sent back to the fields uh to continue working and of course she just begins plotting her next escape so we spend basically the first act of the movie on this plantation with her um there's a couple other uh, characters that we meet, a new addition to the plantation. Uh, her name's Julia, played by Kiersey Clemens. She arrives, um, and there's something off here. The way they're talking is kind of a little too, like it's anachronistic. It's like kind of too modern to be in that like slave <laughs> time, the plantation time period. Um, and there's just some other things that like aren't quite right for the 1860s backdrop, sort of like the Civil War era. Um, and then about a third of the way into the movie, it's just like she goes to sleep and wakes up and it's a completely different person. It's Janelle Monae still. Veron we're, we're told her name is Veronica Henley. Um, and she is, this is modern day. It's present. She is, like I said, a successful author. She's a civil rights advocate, social justice um, advocate who's like, we see her on like a CNN or Fox News type talk show. Uh, debunking some fake news um, and so she's got like this beautiful family a daughter she's traveling to go speak at a conference and she meets up with her friends Gabare Sidibe it plays one of them uh, and she's she's really fun here she's like some much needed comedic relief as like mm. she's just like unabashedly like calling out microaggressions as they're a group of black women and they get their table put in the corner at a restaurant or something like that like she she's just like not willing to accept that so that's fun to see her just like just like call people out and be a much needed like i said much needed comedic relief here but in this second act we meet them we we see her with uh gabri sidibe and lily cowles who plays the other friend sarah um and they're in new orleans after this conference they're having a night out and they split up she's going back veronica is going back to the hotel she gets in a car and she gets kidnapped and so then it's like, it comes together that the big reveal is that no, this isn't as the trailer showed, this isn't like an alternate reality. This isn't time travel. It's literally this woman got kidnapped and was taken to a place in the deep South where civil, like uh, Confederate sympathizers, racist people like play dress up and Tor torture and murder black people and pretend slavery still exists so it's like it's the it's all in the present day it's all the same person it's just like a messed up timeline uh, of storytelling so yeah. that's the big twist um and then i guess to keep a little bit of mystery i won't explain what happens at the end um whether she makes it out escapes or what whatnot but i mean that was basically my biggest takeaway was that this was the movie did you see the hunt i have not the, seen the hunt no that was build supposed to come out last year build is like the most controversial movie ever because it was of course the the liberal elites kidnapping the like deplorables to hunt them most dangerous game style on their their mm -hmm. estate and so that's ba this is basically that but reversed and i that we'll we'll get into i don't want to say all of what i have to say before getting you involved so We'll uh, go ahead here and uh, open it up for some of the questions you may have. <sighs> yeah. Um, so, like, one of the main things I'm curious about is this is like like we've you, we've addressed is that it's being marketed as kind of a horror film in the same vein as Get Out or Us by Jordan Peele, um, even though we know Jordan Peele is not associated with this film really in any capacity. Um, so in in that respect is this movie like scary at all like is it is a horror film like in that genre like are there any scares of note is there any like atmosphere that kind of like had you unsettled because you didn't really yeah in your written review you didn't really touch too much on on that side of it. yeah i would i mean i didn't think no for like 
Short answer, no. I didn't feel like scared really. I mean, there was sort of the, I, there was the reason that this has 44 points out of a hundred from me is like, sure. There, there's like the mystery it's unfolding and stuff. So, I mean, there's some like excitement there as you're putting the pieces together, but like, you put the pieces together in the first third, you know, it's not like there's, there's much after that. So that's why the, the mystery is not nearly as smart as they think it is. Um, but yeah, no real like horror thriller vibes, honestly. Um, don't, there's like one creepy civil war era child who whispers and shushes someone. So like, that's a, you know, the kind of the shining little creepy little girl stereotype. Um, but no, no real stuff. And I know you mentioned the connection, the get out and us Jordan Peele connection. Um, like those are so like psychologically thrilling. They're like provide damning social commentary. It's like stuff that really like makes you think and terrifies you at the same time. This is not the case. This movie was billed as coming from the producer of get out and us like that's on the posters. Mm. And that is factual. This is produced by <laughs> QC Entertainment, who was involved with both Get Out and Us. But when you do, when you say from the producer of Get Out and Us, you think, okay, Jordan Peele made this movie, you know? So I feel like that marketing was almost, I don't blame them because that was like, sure, who's not going to do that and, and stir up? It's clickbait though. Like this is not, Jordan Peele was not involved with this. It was not his like invention or anything like that. And it tries so hard to, to fit into that genre, to fit into to the pantheon of Jordan Peele thrillers, but it's just not even close. Yeah, um, yeah I can imagine because, I mean, I love Get Out. I mean, I think Get Out's outstanding. Um, so to, yeah, I think it's kind of, I mean, it's shady, I think, and, and kind of, I mean, yes, they help produce those movies, but I think with everything they've done with the marketing and, and um, the, the trailers and just the whole aesthetic it just definitely gives off us vibes definitely gives off Jordan Peele vibes um but uh, on on top of the whole horror genre kind of side of things there's also been a lot of talk lately and not just with this movie but in general um like with regards to slave films and kind of slave narratives uh you know is this something that like we really you know need do we need more films where like people like black people are slaves or like what other like slave like narratives like stories are really kind of necessary at this point i know that this is putting a spin on it and kind of putting it in a different type of genre film but i just don't know as someone that has seen it you know do you think that this was kind of the right story that they kind of should have approached or what do you think kind of about that i i mean i think that obviously as a not a black person i'm not really like in the the right place to say like whether or not to continue making those movies but what i will say is that i mean i know jake was when we talked about um a, a movie that like well it was in the news a, a little bit ago um about a movie that Will Smith was working on emancipation. Uh, uh, it was like he had the was of the mindset that like we don't need to keep telling slave stories. Right. Um, but for this particular story, there's so much emphasis placed on the the like brutality and the violence and the the excessive rape and torture. Like yeah, that, the, the first third of this movie is like all about the plantation life, but it's not diving into the character of Veronica. It's not exploring the relationship between her and the other slaves or any sort of like character development. It's just excessive pain and brutality and this, all of the terrible stuff that that's, we do need to move past that stuff. Like nobody, I mean, it's like to compare it to like Game of Thrones, like people talk right. about like, do we need to have like the excessive like rape scenes or the, yeah. the, the the degradation of women in that show. Like that was a, a talking point there and something that it moved away from in the later seasons. But I mean, I, I think that's applicable here as well. That that's, if you're going to tell this story, you can talk about the, the characters and the relationships and their development and stuff. And you don't need to spend, it's similar to like you're talking about with the dog and devil all the time. Like I know yeah. what's happening here. You don't have to show it over and over and over again. 
Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I think there's certain certain narratives that are worth telling and sharing or retelling, but there's a way to do it and there's kind of a way to not do it. Um, but uh, with Monet, who seems to kind of be the one of the few shining lights in this film that you did not like very much. Uh, I believe this is her first like real film where she is the lead, like the, the explicit like main character. Um, she's of course been like renowned in, in other roles before, but what did you see like in her performance here, which is kind of a dual performance, which is cool and, and not like typical um, that you thought was promising. And, and what would you kind of like to see her do um, like that she could take from this film is might not be a good film but that you can kind of build off of yeah i i think that i'm a big fan of her i i think she's one of the moonlight is an incredible movie but she's, she's one so of the one that. of the great parts in that as the yeah. comforting figure to to little but i mean i i think she's very talented we know that she can sing she can dance she can act oh, yeah. Um, she's like a God, triple her, threat. Her Oscar opening was so good. I think we just need to right, say it. right, and she's <laughs> she's performed at the Tonys as well. Like she's very mm-hmm. talented, and I that definitely shows through in this. I mean, she's very deta- I, again. Like I said, there isn't much to work with as far as like character goes when she's uh-huh. playing Eden, the the slave. Um, but she does a great job of like being detached, being emotional, being upset, like all of those horrible things. But like she she. <laughs> portrays them well but then in in present day i mean she's equally charming and appealing as the the modern day author so i mean i think Mm -hmm. that she she does the best with what she's given and how much this movie like the limited amount of this movie lets her develop a character so i mean i'm i'm excited i don't think i don't hold this against her individually as an actress i think that this that hopefully she'll have plenty more opportunities to to be the star in something yeah yeah and i would definitely i mean there's just so many good directors that she could work with and i think would love to work with her so um i i would i would i feel bad that i'm like not seeing this movie because she is you know starring in it but i have my fingers crossed that she'll get some some more juicier and uh you know promising uh projects coming up um and and kind of the last thing i kind of wanted to touch on was with a movie that has this many problems (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and like one that you just were not a fan of what if you could change like one specific thing that you think would improve this movie the most and maybe make it more enjoyable what would it be i think it's going back to the the whole first third like if they were to, i i i understand the limitations that they had because they couldn't really dive into the character too deeply because otherwise it would reveal because like while she's on the plantation she is aware of who she is and her like that she, it's not like she got brainwashed or anything like that so like, yeah if they were to have conversations between the people like oh hey we're really being kidnapped here like this is it's 2020 like you know it would they they're trying not to reveal too much but i mean i just think to have any sort of like character development there instead of focus on on all of the the negative things um that would have been a tremendous bonus to 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 make this like headed in the right direction and then also one of my issues with when it does go to the the present day um that just seems like it's kind of like establishing that but there's no real purpose to it other than to establish that she there is also a veronica in the present day i mean there's not there it just kind of feels like a okay so we had to show you this and now we have to fill 30 minutes before we get to act three so I mean, I think just going again, like I characters all around to go more in depth into to all of that would have been the the thing that makes this it could like potentially it's an interesting premise. It could have bumped it up into like the the sixties or low seventies probably. Okay, okay. Um damn. Yeah, this is just I mean, I don't know what I expected. I, I wasn't yeah, I didn't have super high hopes for this movie, so um, but at, even despite that, it's still kind of a bummer to hear that this was just not um, very good by the sound of it. I mean, nothing nothing that you've said has made me want to watch it. So yeah, I would not. I would definitely not recommend, especially at the the twenty dollar price point. I would I would pass on this one unless you're just dying to to get some sort of new movie to check out. Yeah. 
but I mean, that's, that's it. That's two pretty mediocre movies, uh, <laughs> mediocre to bad movies that we discussed this week. I think the news was the most promising part of this episode, but um, I mean, I, go ahead, go ahead. R- real quick. Uh, speaking of news, Emra Kaya, I don't know if you've ever seen him on Twitter. If you've seen Twitter in the last few minutes, is this some late breaking news? This is it. It's potential. It's not confirmed by anyone. Um, but Emmer Kai has posted an article. Uh, he's kind of a he's a blogger. He's he's done some news and scoops in the past um, that have turned out to be true. But he's basically saying that, and very definitively on his end, that Tom Hardy is going to be cast as the next James Bond after No Time to Die. So yikes! We'll see Cause... if that ends up being true or not, but. That's something that I think we should just throw in real quick because it did just come out uh, in the last I, few minutes. I don't know how to feel about that. I mean, I feel like he's kind of done that already in like the, I don't know, made like a combination of multiple of his characters have been like the sort of like action star spy guy that I don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, I, I like mean, Tom Hardy. I like Tom Hardy. He's, he's a good actor. He's been in some great stuff, obviously Mad Max the best yeah. of them but um yeah i mean i would definitely uh i mean i definitely wouldn't complain if tom hardy was playing james bond i'm not i mean i'm not crazy about james bond as a franchise i mean i've only watched the daniel craig films and I, I mean i love daniel craig as james bond um but i mean given i mean he's a huge famous british actor of course and uh he as you said he has been in some similar you know action action franchise movies so I mean, this has been a very popular kind of fan cast uh, for years now with, with Daniel Craig kind of on that on the way out. Um, so we'll see. I mean, this is not confirmed, um, but maybe you know. Well, maybe by the time you listen to this next week, maybe it will be confirmed or someone else will re- report it officially. But yeah, so that's interesting. We'll see what happens. Um, it's going to be very very uh, curious with No Time to Die still scheduled to come out in November. Um, if anything, will they'll have to shoot like a late post credit scene with Tom Hardy? Yeah, <laughs> Tom Hardy just like walks in and, and grabs the uh, the reins literally from Daniel Craig and is like, "Hey, have fun." Um, yeah, so we'll see. That we will. But for today's episode, thank you all for listening. Thank you for maybe checking out these movies so you could follow along. But again, thank you for tuning in. Uh, yeah, uh, follow us on all <laughs> social media. Um, you know, inside the film room is on Twitter. We're closing in hopefully soon on 1000 followers. We are so grateful. You guys are supporting us over there. Once also we hit, check- once we hit a thousand, we might have a special giveaway going on. So, oh yeah. Get hey. us there. Get us to a thousand. See what happens with that. And then of course we're also on Instagram, TikTok, uh, Facebook, and we have our YouTube channel. that's really popping off. Now we have the Dune reaction video and breakdown that we did recently. And that, our podcast episodes can also be found on YouTube. You can uh, listen to them there. Um, so, and also check us out our personal accounts. Uh, I'm pretty big on Twitter. It's just my name, Johnny Sobchak, Zach Goins. Um, and then we're also on Instagram as well. So got to plug the socials there, but also another thing for you to follow, of course, as always follow us, subscribe on Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, Google, Amazon, wherever you get your podcasts, be sure to subscribe Give us a rating, give us a review so we can climb up those charts and be (laughs) sure to tune in next time as I believe we will be breaking down Enola Holmes, the new Netflix original. It's supposed to be pretty good. We've heard really good things. Love Fleabag. I don't know if you've watched the show Fleabag, but same director here. Love getting Billy Bobby Fleabag Brown. vibes from the footage I've seen. So Yes, very fourth wall break. So (laughs) excited for that one check it out. It comes out on Netflix next Wednesday and you'll be check that out and be good to go for our next episode. But until then, talk to you next time. Bye guys.